You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. Your story is like, that's not defeated you though. The 60% burns like in hospital for years, just going through all yeah, this stuff. So and that's the, the powerful thing about your story. It's like, you've not let it defeat you. You've not just lay there and fucking give no. up. Like, you're now here. Now you do your runs, you're swimming. Like, yeah. you're leaving. This is for anybody watching. This is the gold here. These kind of interviews that, as long as you're still breathing, you've got something to give. I'd already decided, up there if you will, that uh, I was going to glide in and I was going to exit that cockpit early because of the rate of increase and build up of fire that was happening in the cockpit. I thought I'm not hanging around in this thing. So it was building up quite, quite quickly as I was descending and I came up with this kind of exit plan or game plan, if you will, to exit the aircraft earlier. So for the record, I was 63% third and fourth degree burns. Fourth degree burns means that there was exposed bone. So remember I said where the fire breached in the lower um, part of the cockpit. So when my feet were operating the rudder pedals, my shins took the longer period of exposure to the flame and hence the exposed bone with the uh, tibia bones on my shins. So I was a massive trauma. The truth is I just didn't want to fight anymore. So to give you an analogy, I felt like the boxer in the ring, right? If you can picture that. But I wasn't on round 12, you know, kind of fighting and kind of taking a few knocks and a few punches still and getting tired after round 12, like a boxer. I was actually like on round 4,127 after 18 months. And you know what? I was just tired of being in the ring, if you can understand. I was tired of being in the hospital, tired of being in the fight of my life, tired of the open wounds, tired of getting taken down to theatre, sometimes twice a week even, you know? It was just ridiculous. And the wounds weren't healing, the wounds weren't closing up. And I just thought, what life is this? How can I possibly go on? I mean, having had the life that I'd had, gone from being an elite soldier, you know, up here, to sort of ground zero, what life is this? Boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Jamie Hull. How are you, brother? How you doing? Yeah, good to good see to you, man. Good to be here, yeah. Mate, what a story. First of all, we'll touch on the book. What is that? What is that? It's uh, Life on life, a Thread. Life on a Thread. Yeah, Life on a Thread, uh, How My Fight for Survival Made yeah. Me Stronger. Powerful book. Life on a Thread. Very powerful book. It's a plane crash survivor. Like your plane was going down. You ended up going, around, going on to the wing and then jumping off before it hit the ground. Unbelievable. I got lucky with that, James, to be honest. Um, it was a bit of quick thinking, quick action, but um, I was certainly up against it and under a great deal of duress, you know, fire in the cockpit that had breached um, at altitude as well. So um, I was able to just sort of think on my feet, come up with a plan, if you like, based on um, the training. So I'd received a bit of training, you know, with the US instructors beforehand uh, for about three weeks or so. And I just kind of fell back on the emergency protocol and I was able to make a decision to sort of switch everything off on following the, the dashboard or the instrument panel. So I switched everything off from left to right. Um, so everything sort of off, off, off. And then remove the headset, unbuckle the harness, um, very low level sort of gliding in. So descending, 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 gliding in, scrubbed off as much airspeed as I, I could get away with. And then, as I say, low level, open that left-hand canopy door, um, climb up onto the seat, momentarily get onto the wing and sort of balance and compose myself, look at the horizon. And then when the moment was sort of bang on, just right. So I was about estimated about one, five, 15 feet, sort of standing on that left wing momentarily and probably running in at about 30 knots at the time. So about 32, 33 miles per hour, 15 feet above the ground. I looked at the horizon, I just went for it. So I just jumped out off the back, the trailing edge of the left wing, snapped my feet and knees together in the air, hands above my head, and um, sort of 
through that little bit of airspace and then hit the ground and it was you know like I hit the ground like a sack of spuds to be fair yeah. it was a big impact my door that like, your story is like that's not defeated you though the 60 percent burns like in hospital for years just going through all yeah, this stuff so and that's the, the powerful thing about your story it's like you've not let it defeat you you've not just lay there and fucking give no. up like you're now here now you do your runs you're swimming like yeah. you're leaving this is for anybody watching this is the goal here these kind of interviews that as long as you're still breathing you've got something to give but I want to get to know Jamie who you are before the crash what triggered you what you went through well, how was your life then? Obviously, what you're doing now, but let's go right back to the start, brother, where you grew up, how it all began. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, I think it's important probably to to start by saying, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, an incredible story, you know, I came through all that. But probably the reason being fundamentally is because I was always a fighter. I, I kind of knew that. I was always a bit of a scrapper, not necessarily in the physical sense, sort of argy-bargy down the pub. That wasn't really me, you know, sort of this threatening guy. But I was always a fighter in life. I was always trying to fight to, to kind of get on in life and try to make a, a better sense of life from my younger years. I, I kind of started out with um, slightly, uh, a slightly sort of disadvantaged upbringing. I mean, it's not a sob story, and I by no means had a, a sort of a, a dodgy sort of upbringing or anything like that. But all it was um, was that I, you know, in my younger years, in my youth. Um, so my parents weren't getting on they, it was pr pretty evident that they were going to sort of separate at some stage and they did when I was quite young so I was about 12 when that happened and for any kid that uh, you know where the, the family unit sort of breaks down and uh, you know the kids are sort of then perhaps pushed and pulled and perhaps spread to the spread to the winds as it were you know parents separate so my, my sister went with my mother you know my mother moved away my brother and I, my younger brother and I, stayed with my father. My father was busy working. You know, so he was um, long, long distance, um, you know, haulier, you know, driving these big rigs up and down the country and, and getting on with it. And, and so I was this young lad and I became a bit of a tearaway for no other reason other than the fact that I was la a young kid largely unsupervised. You know, dad was away at work. Mum was away, obviously, because parents had separated. And there's me, um, you know, kind of the elder brother, but I was only 12 myself. My brother was 10. And, you know, I stayed with my father because I wanted the continuity in school, you know, to stay with sort of my peer group, my mates. But I was largely unsupervised. So, you know, what happens to a young kid when they're unsupervised? They basically get up to no good because they've got that freedom and they've got that flexibility and no one there to sort of crack the whip. You with me? So that was the that was the you know the essence of my younger years. There I was kind of just kind of getting on with it, but not necessarily at first fo following the righteous sort of you know the proper path. So I was up to no good, bit of a tear away. I was out late in the evenings, and I was kind of like playing truant a bit at school. I was kind of getting involved in sort of a bit of criminal kind of fraternity. Not so we're not talking major league. But nevertheless, I was up to up to no good, sort of up to all hours. I was kind of pilfering and like stealing from shops and, you know, out sort of breaking into a couple of establishments here and there. Um, and just generally a bit of a pain in the arse for as a young lad in society, you know, a bit of criminal damage, bit of theft, some 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 of it sort of escalated and it was a little bit more serious. But I certainly wasn't, you know, like I said, it wasn't major league, but I was definitely following a slippery path in life. And then there was a bit of a turning point in my youth. So I kind of realised that in order to kind of get on and to avoid being kind of caught up with the law, because I got nicked a couple of times by the police when I was quite a young lad, I feel like misdemeanours, you know, pretty sort of petty sort of incidents. As I said, it might have been theft or criminal damage, so I got collared a couple of times by PC Plod when I was that young terror, where that young kid, sort of 12, 13, 14 years of age. Mm -hmm. And I guess I started to reflect on being basically a young hoodlum, really. And I'm starting to think about it all in my mind. I'm starting to reflect. And I'm starting to think, well, 
you know, you, you've got two choices. You can either keep up this pretense of being a bit of a hoodlum, you know, bit of a cock for all intents and purposes. You know, a young lad not towing the party line, getting into trouble clearly because, you know, you're getting nicked a couple of times. And perhaps if you keep going down this path, it's not going to be cautions next time around. You know, you're probably going to go to court. You're probably going to end up with a criminal record that's going to probably haunt you and follow you for, you know, young adulthood and perhaps rest of days. So I kind of got wind and I did sort of heed, you know, the warnings from the police at the time, you know, having got a couple of cautions. And I didn't want to be that, you know, that kind of ne'er-do-well in life that was... Um, following that slippery path and perhaps, uh, you know, literally ending up in the slammer, you know, ending up in jail. So, you know, a bit of crime, there was a bit of drugs, a bit of sort of uh, alcohol indulge, indulgence, you know, at a young age. And before I finally realised, having learnt a couple of valuable lessons, like I said, getting on the wrong side of the law, that if I don't turn it around, no one else is going to turn it around for me. Remember, I was largely unsupervised as a kid and it's not a sob story it's just the way things were in the family and that was like in the early 80s so you know there wasn't really an issue with it you know let's say parents were away or out working and spread and sort of separated and it was up to me this is what I'm trying to say it was up to me to turn things around realize the the errors of my ways as a youngster turn it around for the better like sort of take the high road and sort of, you know, steer away from the low road, as it were, follow a more right, righteous path, and just try and crack on and, and be a better human being as a kid, sort of, you know, going through adolescence and trying to grow up. So luckily for me, that's what I did. I sort of recognised it all, recognised where I was at and where I was kind of potentially heading. And I decided to spin it around and I tried to do better. So I remember getting my GCSE results and they were pretty shocking. I think I got like... Um, one sort of GCSE pass, like the old O level, you know, perhaps. Uh, so, like, what I'm talking about is like a C and above grade at GCSE. So, I think I got like one pass in like English, you know, literature or something. I quite enjoyed books and I quite enjoyed reading. And I got that one pass, and everything else was an abject fail. Got like E's and F's, or, you know, like completely failed. And I was like reflecting on it, thinking, my God, it's like, you know, I've done. I've pretty much done, you know, like 10 plus years of schooling here and this is all I've got to show for it, you know. And um, as I said, I'd been on the wrong side of the, with the law a couple of times and I think only I can turn it around, only I can do better. So I actually went back, repeated my education for that kind of uh, sort of final or secondary GCSE year. I repeated all that, did one day a week at college to do some... Uh, some other input at the local college in Dunstable it was in Bedfordshire and I repeated that that uh, secondary year of GCSE in my high school in uh, Leighton Buzzard in Bedfordshire that was and then I got a load more grades so I end up picking up about I think for the record I got about seven GCSEs you know like the old O-level passes the following year and that was just about good enough for me to go on and do some A-levels and I'm not joking but a couple of years you know, not even that, you know, like a year or so preceding when I said I was getting up to no good and, you know, literally out till all hours and just being a general pain in the arse. Um, so I would have never have foreseen that I could have sort of turned it around and, and gone on to do sort of some A-levels. Now, I think that was probably the start of the turning point for me because I realised that if I was able to go on and do A-levels and potentially get a few grades there then that could open up some doors, right? So we're talking, you know, possible job opportunities, you know, possible sort of higher education. And so that was the road that, that I ended up taking, but later on. So I ended up going on doing, um, I did like three A-levels, got a few sort of, uh, you know, average grades, nothing to really write home about, but it was enough to kind of give me the opportunity in life. And I did consider um, higher education, but I kind of put that on the back burner. Why? Um, I, I initially considered um, a career with the armed forces because I was quite driven by, you know, sports in school. I enjoyed, um, you know, kind of football, rugby, athletics, a bit of cricket in the summertime, but I was a lousy batsman. And I wasn't much, uh, you know, 
I wasn't really a natural academic, I wouldn't suggest, and I wasn't necessarily motivated in that arena. So I thought about, you know, the challenge, the adventure, and where, where was I going to get that? And the idea, I think, talking to someone in school about possible careers, the idea of the armed forces cropped up. And um, I very, very nearly joined the Marines. So I, I went through the, um, um, like the initial kind of, um, you know, reviews and interviews for all of that. And I got an opportunity to, to start the ball rolling with, with the Royal Marines uh, down at Limpstone. But I was able to put things on ice for a little, little bit of time. And the reason I did that, the reason I sort of uh, put things on hold, because I made a decision that I wanted to go travelling. And this was something, I guess, born from, um, you know, perhaps a slightly unsettled youth. And I'd done a few jobs, you know, on the side, as you do, you know, just, just for earning, earning a few a few pennies here and there, saved up a few quid. And, um, and when I got enough money together, I went off traveling. And that was the first thing I did sort of after school, if you will. You know, once I got myself together, generated some, some money through, through some local jobs, I got this round the world ticket and then I was off. And I went to, um, this was the absolute making of me as a young man, really, the truth be told. It wasn't really the education that I described. So I had the courage to go off traveling and I did that on my own. And I went to South Africa, Namibia, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, across the Angolan border even, went up into Malawi. I did all this on my own and like left, so I left home as it were, sort of still while I was 19 years of age. Was that an easy decision? Not really. I mean, it was tough at first, but I felt that, um, you know, something I wanted to try and get out of my system. And I had this somehow, this um, this pull. I'm not sure where that came from, but um, I've always been, you know, kind of a keen traveller and almost a little bit nomadic sort of in the blood. I wanted to get out there in the world, see the world, sample the world for what it for what it can offer you. You know, the you know the countries, the the, the spectacular kind of beauty of it all, the yeah. fact that you know different environments cultures. change, all the cultures, absolutely the yeah. culture, the people. You know, from, and going to see a bit of desert and, you know, um, sort of tropical locations, environments. And Were you feeling lonely at that time? I don't know about lonely, but um, I just had this pull. I wanted to, to search for something. you know, maybe slightly misspent youth. And I'd done a few jobs and I'd sort of done a bit of ec- education in the end, but not really excelled as such. But I just, I really, it was a form of self-education, if you, if you like. And this... Um, this kind of pull that I had to get out there and really see a bit of the world and do something really independent for myself before, you know, the likelihood was that I was going to come back to conventional, normal life. Because I knew that that was inevitable, you know, come back, whatever, settle down, you know, follow the sort of more conventional path. And I wasn't, I guess I was just trying to put that off and um, see where the road would take me. But, um, you know, the traveling was fantastic and really that opened up my eyes. And, and being on your own was actually quite a positive thing for me. So I, I met way? a lot of people. In what way? Well, I met some great people. So interestingly, um, when I was down in South Africa, and I'm down in, um, uh, initially in Johannesburg, long story, but I ended up hitchhiking, you know, literally on the roads. So I took about seven different lifts from, you know, big, uh, big rig sort of truck drivers to, you know, big sort of... Uh, business guys with their BMWs or whatever, driving down that major highway between Johannesburg and Cape Town. And I'm hitchhiking to get all the way because I'm on a limited budget, right? I'm a backpacker and I'm trying to preserve the pennies for the long run, knowing that my my goal was to be on the road for a year because I had that back pocket round the world ticket. So, you know, the, the goal was there because the, the travel tickets were there and I had limited money. I needed to try and preserve that. So where I could... You know, I'd try and do things, you know, beans and rice, so to speak, you know, keep things kind of cheap and simple. If I could save on a bit of public transport or another flight or whatever in country, I would. Uh, but, you know, the obvious thing to do was try and hitchhike. It wasn't necessarily the um, smartest thing to do, according to the locals. I can remember being in um, Johannesburg and I'm walking around in the district in Joburg and this was in 1995, and there I was, a young whippersnapper. And I'm, try- I'm literally walking around, and I could see all these people sort of clocking me, 
some of the locals, you know. Um, and I probably stood out because I'm a white man in Johannesburg, a young guy for all intents and purposes, kind of just cutting around the, around the city. So all these people sort of clocking me on the street, you know, some of them looked a bit sort of dodgy. And I'm, I'm having to sort of think on my feet a little bit. And I didn't want, the last thing I wanted to do was get caught up and get mugged or something like that. So I'm, being, I'm trying to be sort of street savvy. And I can distinctly remember, you know, like these big sort of black beamers and Mercedes kind of screaming down the road, literally. And then the horns would be like, meh, meh, meh. and then guys would wave at me. And I'm thinking, what are they hooting at? What are they waving at? And then I realised it was a sort of almost like a mark of respect from some of the, uh, perhaps the Joburg sort of business set that were driving in and out from the suburbs. And they see me, you know, just a, a young white guy on the street in Johannesburg sort of strutting around. And that wasn't what people did. I was always a bit sort of, uh, you know, perhaps risk averse. And I was willing to uh, sort of push the boundaries a little bit. You get what I'm saying? Yeah. So there was a young lad in Joburg. And people said to me, oh, you don't want to walk out there. You don't want to go on your own. And you definitely don't want to sort of, uh, you know, take too many risks here, you know, because it is a bit dodgy. A lot of people said that to me even when I rocked up at the airport. You know, so... Um, there's me sort of pushing the boundaries, just getting a real feel for the place on the ground. And I had really, really very little life experience, but I was kind of just trying to use my instinct, really, and that was what was kind of driving me along. So anyway, I hitchhiked down to, all the way down to uh, Cape Town. And uh, I wanted to see Cape Town, and I'd heard it was spectacular, it was beautiful. You've got Table Mountain, you've got that big backdrop, and it's one of the most stunning cities in the world. Anyway, I got down there and, um, I mean, long story short, when I was down in Cape Town, I went off on some trips and I ventured around some different areas in South Africa. Ended up going back to Cape Town because I loved it. I thought it was a really picturesque, beautiful city. People were really friendly and the backpackers and so on. So I went back to Cape Town because it was kind of like my favourite location down there. And, um, and there was a guy that was running up to the north and he took this... Um, it was a beaten up old VW camper van. And from memory, this guy was American. I think he was from California. And he kind of put the word out in the backpacker in Cape Town and said, I'm driving up north. I'm going to go up the N1, November 1, the road, which goes from South Africa all the way up to Namibia. Anyone want to come? And there was me sort of sipping, um, you know, this little castle beer or whatever it was in the backpackers in, um, in Cape Town. And I'm taking it all in. And, this, and I knew this guy. I'd been talking to him briefly. And I said, you know what, mate, I'll come with you. I said, um, you know, what, what's the score? I said, you know, what's it going to cost us kind of thing? He said, well, he said, I'm not going to ask for much. He said, just chip in for a little bit of fuel. We'll all club together. And we said, we'll get up there and we'll, we'll have a bit of a road trip. And there I was, you know, joining this small gaggle of folk in the camper van. So we drove up through the dead of night to avoid a lot of the traffic, driving out of um, sort of Cape Town and sort of wider South Africa, head up towards the Namibian border. And that was us up into the desert in the middle of the night. So I was doing quite ballsy things, you know, courageous things. I was quite brave at a young age, you know. I mean, it's not necessarily a boast, but like I said that earlier... that was with you then, Jamie? Do you think, say, again, that's with the mum and dad splitting up, kind of a wee bit of abandonment issue, just looking to search for something on yeah, your travels? Yeah, I think I was just interested in really, like I said, perhaps a bit of a misspent youth... Perhaps I felt that youth had sort of uh, let me down a bit. It's no sob story by any means, but I just wanted to really, now that I was independent and I was a young man and I was venturing out into, into the world, you know, for the first time, as it were, I really wanted to try and make the most of that. And I wanted to try and grab life by the horns and just live life and to really experience life. And the way that I did it, I felt, you know, looking back, I mean, that was what, 25 years ago now, you know, 26 years ago. So the way that I did that and the way that I experienced that, there was probably no better sort of education for a young guy that's really trying to initially make something of himself and find himself, as it were. So for me, that was, um, that was a real education. You know, you talk about university of life. That, to me, was like the ultimate, you know, get out there in the world on your own, go to somebody's... Um, weird and wonderful locations and countries, some of which were a little bit hostile, might I add. And, you know, get to meet the people, meet the culture, you know, 
befriend people, but use your judgment and, and stay savvy. You know, that was um, an eye-opener. That was a real education yeah. in itself. And I got a lot out of that. I really did. What places were hostile? What was that? What places were hostile? Well, so... Certainly, you know, I felt that, you know, bits and pieces of South Africa were hostile. And anyone that's been down there will know what I, what, will know what I mean. It's not sort of, you know, necessarily on the face of it hostile. But, you know, it's not like there's an abject war zone going on. But there is a definite divide between, you know, blacks and whites. And unfortunately, there's the racial tensions and the racial issues. And I sort of felt that and sensed that when I was down there. You know, some of the local guys, some of the Afrikaans would sort of tell me stories. And you hear about stuff on the grapevine. And there was an incident when, um, so, I mean, this is a story in itself, but I'll keep this bit sort of brief. But I ended up getting a job later on. I ended up traveling in the north, met some, I met a gentleman up there that was a director of a business, gave me an opportunity to work for his business. And he had a, basically, you know, he had markets down in places like Durban, Joburg and Cape Town. He said, if you want a job, you know, long story short, I'll give you a job. I met this guy in the north. A great, great guy, I remember. And, um, you know, when I was thinking about it, I thought, you know what, a job would be quite handy because I could earn a few South African rand, was the local currency. It's not going to make me a rich man by any means, but basically what that helped me was to preserve my own sort of bank balance to enable me to have the sustainability and the longevity to keep traveling around the world on my own sort of budget. So I thought it'd be useful to get this little job. So I went back down to Cape Town and I went to the market and I met the people who were in the market. So it wasn't the guy in the north that had sent me down there with this little business card. I handed it over to the guy on the market who was the manager. These are big markets. It wasn't like, you know, your sort of high street market in a market town in England or, you know, somewhere in the UK. This was, um, these were big sort of touristy markets and they were selling arts and crafts so all this stuff was being bought in the north from Zimbabwe Zambia um, and and then they were being shipped down you know in trucks in vehicles and they were selling it in the south to slightly more affluent sort of tourist market yeah and so I got a job on the market as a salesman I mean I was a pretty lousy salesman at first but I learned you know off some of the other staff and so the staff members were predominantly white Afrikaans and there was a few black guys that worked on the, on the market as well. Quite interesting because um, um, they, they lived out of town. So they lived on a township which was about 10 kilometres up the road, about six, seven miles outside of Cape Town. Big township. We're talking several thousand sort of people at the time. And again, you know, 25 years ago. And there was one particular incident where, I think it was a bank holiday or something, and ordinarily... Um, so they would get in the vans and we would drive them back to like a rendezvous point. And this was like a petrol station somewhere in the suburbs of Cape Town. And I think they'd pick up a local train from there. Yeah. And they would, that, would, that train would essentially bust them back in towards the township. And that was how they kind of came to and from. But because it was bank holiday, so the, um, the black Africans that worked on the market and they were doing quite a lot of the maintenance work and... Um, working on the the arts and crafts and the curios as they were called they needed to get back home right in the evening even though it's the bank holiday but the trains weren't running so i remember the boss came to me and he was an african sort of white uh, chap and uh, i'd got to know him really really well and uh, he said to me he said i've got to um because i was a driver i had a driving license so i was doing some of the the van driving and delivering people and you know dropping people off and running errands and all the rest of it for the markets. That was part of what I did. And um, so the boss came to me and he said, I need to get these guys back to the township. Reason being, trains aren't running, it's bank holiday, yada, yada, yada. So I was like, okay, he said, uh, so what can, I, what can I help you with? And he said, well, he said, um, we're going we're gonna to drive back to, we're going to drive back to my place first of all. And then he said, we'll, we'll, take, we'll then take a run back and we'll pick them up. And then he said, we'll basically proceed to take them to the township. And I, and I, and I said, okay, fine. I said, why don't we um, take the guys to, um, you know, take the guys out to, you know, your, your home or your suburb? He said, no, 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 no. He said, I'm not having that. He said, 
He said, we need to go back to mine first. Trust me, it'll, it'll make sense. We drive back to mine. We'll come back to the market. We'll pick up the guys. We'll leave them just sat here. just They, they can just relax. And then we'll drive to the township. So I thought, okay, fair enough. He doesn't want the guys, you know, going to the, the area where he lives. He doesn't want to see, you know, the guys to see where he actually lives in the suburb of, of Cape Town, as it were. So that sort of sent alarm bells straight away because I thought, well, clearly there's this divide. You know, the two sort of cultures don't necessarily trust each other. And I, and I kind of understood that. The manager, the, the guy in charge, he didn't want these, these, Af- these black Africans to know where he lived. I thought it was a little bit sad in a way. But, um, you know, there were these tensions, like I said. And um, so we went back, we ended up going back to his place. And I kid you not, um, he basically went into the house, this, this chap, and he brought, out, he brought out a handgun. And he basically said to me, here, have you ever used one of these before? And I'm like, Pro. I said, uh, listen, I said, I have handled one, but only because my, my grandfather took me to a gun club when I was a kid. So this was pre, you remember they changed all the laws in the UK um, after the Dunblane incident. Um, up in Scotland but my grandfather before all that was a keen sort of um, amateur shot and he used to go to the local gun clubs and he used to fire off on the ranges you know and hit the hit a few targets so when I was a teenager he took me down to the gun clubs a couple of times just for a bit of target practice so I had had like small experience with a with a revolver as it were with a with a basic firearm and this guy the manager of this market said have you ever used one of these and I said well limited experience you know kind of thing I'm not too happy about that. And he said, well, he kind of handed it to me, gave me a quick overview of the weapon and said, right, if you need to use this, he said, don't hesitate. He said, well, we're going somewhere where it's going to be a bit dodgy, you know, and um, he said, we need to get these, but we need to get these guys back because I'm obligated to help them get back to the township, get back home tonight. So there I was, and this this thing was in the glove box, you know, sort of tucked away, this... Uh, this small revolver and I'm, I'm a young bloke with very little life experience really at that stage at that stage of the game and we go back to the township and we pick up let's say we pick up the black African guys that had been working on the market and there was about eight to ten of these lads and they all piled into these, the back of this big VW transit sort of panel van thing big white van and then we drove the ten kilometres out towards the township and as we drove inside, the sun was starting to go down and we were having to stop every couple of hundred yards to go over these big speed bumps, like these sleeping policemen. You know, there's a big sort of pause over the bumps and we drive on a bit further. We end up having to drive something like two or three miles inside of the township. I mean, this township was such a built-up area. There's so much um, habitation in there. There's a lot of bodies in there. There was something like... 7,000 people living in there from what I was told and then and, th- and, and the boss basically reminded me remember this guy that I'm, that I'm with that's driving he said remember remember the gun he said if you have to use it if we if it, it you know if someone if it, we end up getting followed and, and we have to use this he said don't hesitate to pull that gun if you need it and um, he said I suggest you get it out of the glove box so I'm holding this thing and my hands were like literally shaking yeah, because I'm thinking, Jesus, right, is it that sort of hostile in here? And we're driving in and we're driving all over these bumps and we're heading up deeper into the township. And the sun's going down, it's about six, seven o'clock at night. And then all of a sudden, this kind of like small, open-backed pickup truck comes towards us on the road. And of course, we have to slow down for one of these speed bumps, don't we? The oncoming vehicle has to do the same, so he slows down as well. And as we're going over the bump, the driver and his kind of co-pilot, his passenger, and all the guys in the back, it looked like they'd been out on the roads working or whatever, construction. So there's a bunch of guys in the back all stood up with like shovels and pickaxes. And we look at them, they look at us, they clock the fact that there's two white guys driving this VW panel van. In their township, we're about two miles inside of the township. And we've stopped to negotiate and navigate this speed bump. And we've got several more speed bumps to negotiate on the two miles to get the hell out of there. 
And all of a sudden, the boss that was driving, he just floors this vehicle, so pedal to the metal. He floors it, and there's this, like, ugly noise as the vehicle kind of, like, accelerates down the street, like, you know, kind of full speed. He drops a gear, floors it down the road. And he's looking in the mirror, and he's looking like that, and he's saying, shit, shit. He said, they're turning round, they're turning round. He could see the reverse lights. And he said, he said, remember what I said, remember what I said. And my hands were like that, shaking. And how the hell we got out of there in one piece? Because we were going over the speed bumps like bang, bang, crash, bang. And it felt like the bottom end of the van was going to drop off and fall out. And the axles were going to drop off the vehicle. But it was like, um, you know, it was just something like something out of a tense uh, movie scene in my mind. Suddenly we bounce over about a dozen or so speed bumps every 200 meter interval. We cover the distance we need to get out of the main entry exit point in the township. And somehow miraculously we're back onto the open highway and it's sort of smooth tarmac. And the van was sort of like ruggedly sort of still tanking down the road. It just sort of held together, God knows how. And we're back sort of on the highway now, sort of in sort of almost sort of darkness, heading back towards kind of Cape Town proper. But that really put the wind up me. And it kind of, it dawned on me, you know, just how much tension there was and how much risk there was perhaps uh, in, in that country. I mean, you don't necessarily think about it. But, yeah, you only you know, think about the consequences if something really happens and then you get the fear. But if you're sure. living fearless and then nothing really happens, then you can't really judge it on anything. But if something does happen and it's a close call, then that's when you start assessing everything. So when did you join the army then? What age? When did you come back then from the world trip and then join the army? Was that a plan to join the army straight away? Yeah, so later on, um, so I did that year's travel. I ended up, um, I mean, long story short, I ended up joining the police for a few years. That was a career that I did locally with uh, Thames Valley Police. And, um, but I was interested, again, in something a bit sort of, uh, a bit of a bigger sort of perhaps more global challenge. So... The idea of the armed forces again appealed to me, and I, I took, I ended up taking a sabbatical from the police after um, only about three short years of service. I ended up going on, going off to do a bit more work around the world, and I was working as a diver in various loca locations because I was teaching, I was instructing, um, and that was just a personal interest. You've personal. done some. You've done a lot, Jamie. I've done a lot. Yeah, I've crammed a lot. a lot in. What was it, the police like for three years? What was it like being in the police force for three years? Yeah, enjoyed it. I, I mean, listen, it's not an easy job. And I've said this, you know, to many groups that I've spoken to. I'd said that was a life education in itself because, of course, you're dealing with, um, you know, the good guys. You know, you're dealing with people that are perhaps, uh, you know, just innocent, innocent sort of victims of crime um, or aggrieved members of society for whatever reason. And, um, you know, there's a lot of good people out there in society, let's not forget. And you're there to serve. Um, but, you know, you're also dealing with the darker side of life in the police. And there was, you know, there was incidents that, uh, you know, that kind of stayed with me, you know, where, you know, um, I had, uh, so I was, I was privy to sort of murder investigations that I assisted, uh, you know, colleagues in the CID department. Um, you know, I wasn't a detective. I was only um, a police constable kind of in uniform, but occasionally I'd get sort of seconded across to help out on sort of bigger, wider sort of murder investigations. And some of those incidents and, and um, things that, you know, that I, that I kind of heard of and, you know, was subject to as, as part of the investigations kind of stayed with me in my mind. And it was, um, it's interesting, you know, but um, a lot goes on out there, a lot of stuff that doesn't even get reported as well, you know, perhaps not within the public interest or, um, you know, deemed... Uh, perhaps, uh, I don't know, just not necessarily um, suitable to, for the media to report. And of course, you know, sometimes a lot of, a lot of things, you know, society, I think, largely is protected uh, from certain harrowing events, because I think it would probably be quite depressing if you heard exactly what was going on all, all the time across a typical kind of force area. Uh, but there's a lot of things that happen, and there's a lot of, a lot of pieces that the police are there to kind of serve four and sort of pieces to pick up as yeah. it were did that affect you being in the police force um seeing that shot? i did i mean I, i'll admit i found things a little bit depressing um and um you know it, it's it's not always kind of happy go lucky and you've kind of got to constantly nurture your mental well 
health, sorry, mental health well-being, I think, as an officer in that job. I think that's important that you do that and you keep yourself on the straight and narrow and you keep yourself well. So, I mean, I did, I used to tap into, you know, a lot of sport and I used to be a keen runner and keep myself fit and active kind of outside of the job, which kind of helped me to cope with the rigours of the job on the inside. Because, you know, the, with the nature of what you're dealing with, sort of day shift, late shift, night shift, constant rotational shift patterns, it takes its toll on the body and, it, and, and all of that kind of takes its toll on the mind. So you've got to nurture your, your health and well-being, like I said. Um, but I did enjoy the job largely, but I just felt that, you know, there was perhaps more to life than potentially another 25 years in that career. So hence my interest, you know, went back towards, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, the thought process of joining, uh, joining the army. And then I did that. So I took that sabbatical. As I said, I ended up doing a bit of travel around the world, doing some expedition work doing some dive work in various locations. And then following that, um, about a year, as it were, sort of back on the road, traveling, um, I came back and I ended up going off to university. So that was later for me. So I was a mature student. I went off to do a languages degree. And um, What language? I did uh, Scandinavian languages, actually. There was um, uh, some influence um, in, in, the, you know, on, um, in my family. So I've on my sort of mother's side, it's a bit sort of distant, but there was a bit of influence there. And, um, and I was kind of curious and I thought, interesting to go and spend some time out in Scandinavia perhaps. And being a mature student, it didn't really matter what degree that I did. I was just interested to kind of get the experience of gaining the, the degree and um, kind of having that life experience as it were. And I thought it might come in handy kind of for future careers and the options that are available. So um, I decided to sort of follow my my sort of instinct on that head off to university for a few years end up living in Norway in my second year and sort of blagging a year um, sort of working um, with a center that did a lot of sort of uh, mountaineering sort of training and I loved all that I mean I was in my element uh, learning new skills kind of climbing and skiing and ski touring I took my dive gear out there I was diving in the deep fjords as well and that was a lot of fun I ended up teaching some of the locals um, and that was a good bit of uh, helped me to sustain my time over there because the beer's about well, it was about ten pound a pint, and that was twenty years uh, ago. Uh, so uh, gives you a bit of pocket money anyway if you can find a bit of local work, which really helped me. Um, and then um, also during my time at university, so um, I, I actually ended up um, volunteering. So I joined something called Cambridge University Officer Training Corps. It's quite an interesting unit um, attached to the university. And I, um, so I had exposure with the, perhaps what the British Army had to offer. So for the record, Cambridge OTC was a bit of a re recruitment workshop for prospective, uh, you know, younger students, you know, people that were, were aspiring to perhaps join the army, be it regular service full-time or reserve, reservists. And, um, and I had this fantastic exposure. So I did like a lot of fam visits, what they call familiarization visits. And I was getting to go off with various regiments and corps and uh, for like these long weekends and see what it was all about and kind of get thoroughly spoiled staying in um, um, sort of posh offices, messes and having fancy black tie dinners and, and kind of during the daytime, you'd get kind of um, familiarization with the various tools and assets that say the infantry possessed or the, um, the Royal Engineers or the Royal Electrical Mechanical Engineers or, or the Royal Ar the, uh, Armoured Corps. So you get to sort of play with all the tools and, and, and equipment that the British Army had to offer. And so therefore it was great exposure. That's what I'm getting at. And it, it was food for thought about the future. Like what was I interested in? What line perhaps did I, did I, did I consider taking if indeed that, that was going to be a career option for me? And then, um, so the other part of it was I went on um, if you like, with the OTC. I did a lot of courses. My commanding officer was keen as mustard, quite honestly. And he knew that I'd been in Norway for a year as a student, having a lot of fun and games out there in the mountains. So he immediately, he was a keen skier himself, um, this gentleman. He sent me back um, to do a ski course. I ended up doing a skiing instructor's course. I think I did a ski tour leader's course, which is basically like mountain leader, but on skis, sort of guiding groups. Um, I did a PTI's course, 
So I did. I had a lot of opportunities. You know, I did driving courses uh, up to sort of HGV class one. You know, the the big rigs. So I got some f- great experience. And then um, I was considering the future. So life beyond that unit. So life beyond the OTC or Officer Training Corps, and what what lay ahead potentially. And um, it was put to me. Um, I think it could have been the CO actually said to me, would you be interested in doing all arms commando course, you know, the Marines? And I thought, yeah, I would be, because I was really interested in that, remember, as, as a kid How old when I left you? school. So by that stage, I was sort of um, 26, 27, perhaps. So pretty old to be doing. Yeah, I was quite, I was an older recruit. Stuff, yeah, yeah. So I was probably six, seven years behind my contemporaries mm-hmm. when I went to university. I was a mature student, you know, a mature student sort of in reality and in, and in inverted commas as far as the university was concerned. But the OTC um, was uh, was great opportunity, you know, for me to sort of test the water as to whether I was interested in a career, whether it was full-time or reserve service. And um, so it was put to me about this commando course, All Arms Commando, but I couldn't get the time off that I needed from my dean of faculty in the languages department at uni. Couldn't get the time off. I was politely... Um, denied that that period of time that I needed to go off and do that military course so I went back to the the boss basically the CEO and said sorry sir it's not happening and then I think more or less straight away somebody had suggested well why don't you go why don't you see if you can do P company and I was like well what's P company and he said well P company is the regimental selection for the parachute regiment and of course I'd heard of the paras para reg and I thought well that's uh, that's going to be a challenge that's going to be you know that's going to be tough. That's going to be something to aspire to. Similarly to the Marines, it was the challenge that I was still looking for. Remember, I'm still mid-20s, so I'm still hungry for that adventure, that challenge. And um, I ended up, it was a little bit shorter course. So again, I knew I probably wouldn't get the permission, but I just blagged it anyway. I just went and kind of ended up playing catch-up with the kind of academia afterwards. So that course was about a month um, full-time up at Catterick in North Yorkshire and I surprised myself actually I found the course you know bloody difficult I mean it was nails I mean anyone that says otherwise is probably lying through their back teeth but P Company for me and for you know respect to all the powers or ex powers that are out there um, it's a it's a damned difficult course it's very high speed a lot of short sharp events you know, you've got to score points on everything and it culminates in a test week and you're doing log runs, you're doing stretcher races, you're doing the milling, you know, the boxing, standing toe to toe with your opponent in, in the ring. And, um, and you're doing all these short, sharp sort of squad runs as well. Everything's high speed, like max speed. And you're literally, you feel like you're being beasted within in, in an, an inch of your life. So that taught me a hell of a lot about my own personal character. Above all, it taught me about you know digging deep within my character to sort of really pull something gritty out of the bag in terms of my own personal performance as it were because i think in something like para reg or indeed the marines you have got to be a veritable athlete not only in the physical sense but in the mind because you've got to be able to sustain your performance over long periods of time you know i mean the selections kind of dictate that but not just that it's like the job dictates that. So being a soldier in one of the more kind of elite regiments, um, you know, you've got to dig deep for long periods of time in the patrols on the ground and you've got to sustain yourself in kind of arduous environments, you know, and, um, and that, takes, um, that takes a lot of uh, get up and go and, and motivation and, and hunger. And not everybody's got that. It's not yeah. everybody's cup of tea. So that's why it's a little bit different from perhaps kind of just regular soldiering yeah it seems a bit extreme but do you think that element of doing that training has helped you today after your crash to then never fucking quit keep pushing yourself to the limits dig deep within to then realise that you can still give more I think to be fair it's a great question I've had this a lot so I think yes my military you know experience and training um, and I did a lot in terms of training, in terms of selections, in terms of exposure to the wider British Army, I did I did a lot. I feel like I gained a lot of experience, and I travelled a lot with them, and I went all over the world, and then you know I eventually went sort of 
SF selection with um, with the SAS with with two one SAS for um, a number of years. But it's not so much of a boast in my case because the truth is I've got nothing really to report on 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 any of that front other than I did it. I kind of qualified. I kind of went through the selection process, like I mentioned. I kind of gained the cap badges, and I kind of served for a period of X. I went all over the world. I sampled lots of different environments and sort of worked in you know very extreme different temperature ranges from abject cold to you know seriously hot locations on the planet. But I never really went anywhere in terms of um, operational deployment. It never quite happened for me because. Um, I got injured in the summer of 2007, which I'll, I'll come on to. But in order to perhaps answer the question, I think the fight in me was always there from a young age. I think you're perhaps born with it. You either got it in the bank, as it were, you possess it or you don't. And I think that's, that's true for a lot of individuals. They're deep down, they're true fighters, you know, in that sense, or they're probably just a bit average. You know, and I think I was always a fighter. But what I will say about the military is that the, the kind of training that I went through, whether it was um, selection for para-reg or selection for UK Special Forces, it definitely teaches you to dig that bit deeper within your personal character, to really find the depths of what you're truly capable of that you perhaps didn't believe that you were capable of. And it takes you to places that you probably ordinarily are unlikely to ever go to otherwise, if you understand. Mm -hmm. So I think that was the fundamental difference, having gone through those kind of processes in life. I learned as an individual to dig very, very deep and to bloody well hold on at all costs. And I think that part, as well as being a kind of a natural born fighter, perhaps, but that learning to really dig deep and hold on mm -hmm. as a result of military service combined was perhaps what helped me. And it's just a suggestion, but it was perhaps what helped me to ultimately hold on, you know, when I sustained later on, you know, a major trauma and indeed, um, you know, a huge, you know, third degree burns injury. When did you learn how to fly planes? So that, that was something that I did as a personal ambition in the summer of 2007 and again it was something that cropped up in my mind you probably get the idea in the sense now that you jump on anything that you've got up here for sure so i was always one of these yeah. guys that rather than be down the kind of pub you know kind of elevating bicep and kind of talking the talk i was one of these guys that not only would talk the talk but if i came up with an idea that i felt quite uh, compelled to go off and do in life I did it and I was one of these guys that would also walk the walk that's what I'm saying and so I just I like to get on and again I like to challenge myself and the idea came up that um, I, I was very interested to learn to fly and that was simply born because as a kid um, my late grandfather so my dad's dad um, he was um, a keen sort of aviation spotter and he also trained as a pilot, um, you know, to, at the back end of the Second World War. But he was very young in service with the RAF. Uh, and the war sort of wound up. Um, but he was a spotter and he worked in the kind of aviation sector for British Aerospace Engineering. And as a young kid, he used to take me to Luton Airport. So there I was sort of face pressed up against the, um, the boundary fence with a broken binocular. And I'm looking through to the other side at the active runway. And, um, you know, watching all the big boys kind of throttling up the engines and getting ready for sort of pre-flight checks and obviously taxiing out to the, the active runway and takeoff. So I would watch all that going on in the distance as a young boy. And that was absorbing. You know, I was kind of inspired by that whole scene as a young lad. And I thought maybe one day I'd like to learn to fly. So years later, the kind of maybe the seed was there and I kind of wanted to act on that, right? Remember, because the kind of character that I was. So I got a bit of downtime, summer of 2007. I'd just been given the nod with my regiment that I was about to deploy out to um, just general operational deployment. We had a, we had a, a tasking on, and it was definitely going to happen that, um, 
that uh, autumn of 2007. So I had a little bit of downtime. I had about six to eight weeks pro prospectively. And I chose to fulfill the ambition. So I came to London. Um, I managed to persuade the powers that be at the US Embassy that I was good for it, that I wasn't a sort of a, um, some kind of risk. Because remember, this was post 9-11. And they were obviously a bit tetchy about who they were going to give visas to, for especially for foreigners to learn to fly within U.S. airspace for obvious reasons. So I persuaded them that I was wasn't a risk, got my visa, and I was armed with that, if you will. And I went off to the states, and I specifically chose Florida because of the likelihood of, um, you know, some decent weather over perhaps a six-week period, and the likelihood I was going to get the flying done in a in a good, you know, reasonable time frame and not get rained off. And um, and when I was out there, if I kind of speed up and fast forward, I was a month into the course and um, and I was now pilot in command, so flying solo, just flying between small municipal airports in the local kind of um, part of Florida. After just a month? After just one month, you were learning how to fly your Yeah, just, just after one month. Is that, you are, yeah, so do you, you, you become you get, a fast learner though, get, or is that? Well, I think, no, fairly, probably average. I don't think I was sort of, uh, you know, um, you know, particularly extraordinary in that sense. You know, you get to a certain point and then you go solo and then you're sort of qualified. You get signed off to fly as a solo pilot. So you can then go pilot in command and fly the aircraft on its own and you're then our building. So that's what I was doing. I was doing my hours, sort of just small little hops, or indeed going up into the local um, airspace, into the local pattern over the aerodrome. And on this one particular day, I had, um, I had an engine fire. So what my first alert was, I looked out the left-hand canopy and there was a thin streak of like visible yellow orange flame. And I did a double take. And I thought, yep, sure enough, that's flame. And then no sooner as I sort of made my final turn now into wind, approaching the active runway down below, the fire uh, then immediately breached the cockpit down below in the footwell. So I looked down, I saw flames coming in around my feet and ankles. So as I'm descending, um, the flames were starting to build up within that small two-seater cockpit. And I'm having to think on my feet and I'm getting flustered and I'm thinking about it all. Sort of left hand on, on the uh, flight control stick, right hand on the throttle. And I'm descending, descending, and the fire's building up. And all of a sudden, I probably get to about half the height. So I'm now about 500 feet indicated on my altimeter on the instrument panel. And I make a decision that um, I'm going to actually glide uh, and veer away and glide in. So I veer away from the concrete runway below and head towards a grassy stretch and an embankment in the distance. And the reason being is I'm going for soft ground. And I'd already decided, up there if you will, that uh, I was going to glide in and I was going to exit that cockpit early because of the rate of increase and build up of fire that was happening in the cockpit. I thought I'm not hanging around in this thing. So it was building up quite, quite quickly as I was descending and I came up with this kind of exit plan or, or game plan if you will to exit the aircraft earlier. So the idea was to glide in, get very low level and that's exactly what I did. So I've, I systematically switched everything off in sequence, removed the headset, unbuckled my harness, opened the canopy door, very low level, as I mentioned earlier, 15 feet above the ground, thereabouts. I was able to get on the seat onto the left wing and jump. I landed in long, soft grass. It was a relatively soft landing, but it, I did come in like a sack of spuds. I landed feet first, but then there was a secondary impact so face first is the grass, soft ground, but the grass is like razor blades in the tropics. And I had a bilateral nasal fracture. I had superorbital eye socket fractures above both eyes. It fractured. Uh, multiple soft tissue lacerations from the sharp grass. I popped a collarbone, hyperextended my left index finger, which fractured. Inadvertently ruptured my colon, my large intestine, internally lacerated one side of my liver also internally which was now bleeding and but the worst of it was the life changer and the showstopper for me was the fact that I was um, so for the record I was 63 percent third and fourth degree burns fourth degree burns means that there was exposed bone so remember I said where the fire breached in the lower um, part of the cockpit so when my feet were operating the rudder pedals 
my shins took the longer period of exposure to the flame and hence the exposed bone with the uh, tibia bones on my shins. So I was a massive trauma all in all and I was very lucky that um, I got airlifted from the scene within probably about 15 minutes. I had a, an ambulance on the ground, so a, a vehicular, you know, uh, small ambulance. They must have uh, hit me with a bit of morphine because suddenly the pain was kind of alleviated somewhat because just before that, the pain was kind of off the charts. It was absolutely hideous, indescribable is the only word that I, I could, you know, kind of um, honour it, quite frankly, because it was that hideous. And I didn't think I was going to be able to hold on. So when they gave me that little syrette of morphine, life was pretty damn good. And But I knew in my subconscious, in my mind, that it was really bad. It was exceedingly you know, bad for me. And the likelihood was I wasn't going to make it. So I got airlifted a very short time later. There was probably a helicopter on scene within about another five minutes. Airlifted me to um, Orlando Regional, which is a very premier hospital trauma uh, facility in, in Florida, in that part of the USA. And the rest is history. So I was lucky. I had those medics, those doctors, those nurses, um, interventional radiologists, physiotherapists, all manner of surgical specialists working on me 24-7, round the clock for the next six months of my life. The bill, the medical bill, it's not a boast, but just to give you an indication of what they had to do for me, and that was 2007, so 14 years ago now, but the bill was more than 2.6 million US dollars. So that gives you an indication of how much work they did for me. Mm. And um, yeah, the rest is history. I mean, I was luckily... God knows how, but somehow miraculously able to pull through the trauma. But it took me a long time. So six months drug-induced, two years in the hospital. So they flew me back to the UK. I was on the Burns unit in Chelmsford in Essex uh, for a couple of months. I was in Stoke Mandeville for about 16 months or so for a very long period in the Burns unit in Aylesbury, Stoke Mandeville. So two years hospital. I had 62 operations under general anaesthetic and we talked about the need to fight and the need to hold on. So, I mean, that's testimony right there. Two years in the hospital, 62 surgeries under general. And that to me was the hardest thing that I ever had to go through. I mean, you know, you know I kind of talk a little bit about the history and the build up towards getting injured in the, in the flying incident in, in Florida. But to be fair, all of that paled into insignificance in terms of what I inadvertently was forced to pull out of the bag in order to survive the burns. Yeah. Tell me this, Jamie, with the pain you went through, the two years, all the operations, everything, is there a part of you ever think that you wish you'd have died on yeah, the plane? Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, I make no, no bones about hiding this because I think it's important from a mental health kind of perspective and I think it can kind of kind of inadvertently help others so that's why I do partly what I do now as a speaker and I go out there and I do a bit of public speaking and talk to all manner of different audiences but and I have been doing that for a number of years but I honestly believe that look if I can come through that gravity of of trauma and that gravity of injury and go on to make a relative success of life in terms of active health and active recovery you know i mean you don't i've learned that you don't have to be a superman but it's good to be somewhat active to get on right to to feel better about yourself and to promote your own self-esteem so i feel that um i feel that you know um it's important that uh, i share it and and as you touched on you know i reached the very lowest ebb of humanity frankly so in my own journey, in my own testimony, what I mean by that, and I'm going to quote a very tiny aspect of my story as is written in the book, as is published. So I became the adjunct of machinery, a living receptacle for machines, tubes, wires, and powerful pharmaceuticals. Now, if you can picture that, that was me when I was laid up in intensive care for those six months. You know, I've got a machine breathing for me. I've got 
um, a yellow tube, they call it nasogastric, feeding me into the stomach through the nose. I've got, you know, renal failure going on. So I've got dialysis machines kind of filtering my blood 24 seven. You know, I've had, you know, pneumonia, you know, where the lungs have been infected. I've had septicemia, so blood poisoning, and all these very powerful antibiotics are the pharmaceuticals keeping me alive for those, those kind of, those, for, those former years of, of the trauma. And the truth is I got to about 18 months down the road and I ended up, you know, at my lowest ebb because frankly, the truth is I just didn't want to fight anymore. So to give you an analogy, I felt like the boxer in the ring, right? If you can picture that. But I wasn't on round 12, you know, kind of fighting and kind of taking a few knocks and a few punches still and getting tired after round 12, like a boxer. I was actually like on round 4,127 after 18 months. And you know what? I was just tired of being in the ring, if you can understand. I was tired of being in the hospital, tired of being in the fight of my life, tired of the open wounds, tired of getting taken down to theatre, sometimes twice a week even, you know. It was just ridiculous. And the wounds weren't healing, the wounds weren't closing up. And I just thought, what life is this? How can I possibly go on? I mean, having had the life that I'd had, gone from being an elite soldier, you know, up here, to sort of ground zero, what life is this? And I couldn't see the future, and I could see, couldn't see the light. So I made a concerted decision that um, I wanted to check out, and I considered um, going down the road of, um, you know, getting that assistance to do so with, um, with Dignitas. Switzerland. And, 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 and assisted suicide. Yeah, that was the journey that I, th that I kind of thought was the logical way out. You see, I didn't want to do something daft. I couldn't sort of be one of these guys that, I don't know, on the black market picked up some dodgy firearm or took a bottle of pills and drank, and drank like half a bottle of whiskey or something. That just wasn't me. You know, I'd come this far in life. I couldn't just end it through some messy, sloppy sort of ordeal. That, that wasn't me. I was always a kind of an orderly type of guy and I needed to check out in an orderly fashion. But for me, Dignitas was a viable, credible, kind of neat option, shall we say. And in my logical mind, that was the way to go because I didn't want to be here. Remember, I was 18 months in, tired of being in the fight. I couldn't do it any longer. Every day was a mission and I was in a very, very dark place mentally and really, really just did not want to be here anymore. But luckily I managed to turn a corner. So I had some, um, let's just say external kind of um, influence and assistance in the form of uh, a gentleman from uh, the ministry. So a guy came from uh, um, a church parish, I believe it was over Oxford way. And this gentleman was from sort of deeper Africa. I think he was on some kind of secondment. So I remember, um, they said, you know, would you like this visit? And I said, well, whatever. I couldn't care less at that stage, quite frankly. Uh, but they kind of talked me into having this visit from this guy. He just said he wanted to come and visit me, and he was from the church over Oxford Way. And to my kind of astonishment, I was expecting some white guy in a dog collar to rock up, you know, from the church. And it wasn't. It was a black guy in, like, civilian clothing and with an African accent. And he got chatting to me, and I, I just... You know, in, in a way, uh, there was something about this guy that that sort of resonated with me, and maybe because I'd spent time in Africa myself, and remember I'd worked with some of those guys down in Cape Town, and um, we got chatting, and we kind of just talked about life, and we shared snippets of our former life and our history, and blah blah blah. And I told him I'd been to Africa, and he was quite impressed by that, you know. And um, anyway, we got talking, and somehow he managed to tap into my sort of psychology a little bit. And he was listening to me, that was the important thing, he was listening to me. And when I said, look, look mate, this is what I want. I don't want to be here any longer because of the, you know, the kind of grotesque position that I find myself facing in this life, having, ever, having been through what I've been through, and I just want to check out, that's where I was. And he was listening, he was taking it all in. And he turned around and said to me, you know what? He said, I understand it, I get it. He said, I tell you what, I'll help you and I'll take you. And I'm like, what, are you for real? 
he was the first bloke that had actually said to me, yeah, I'd basically drive you out to Switzerland and help you do and achieve what you need to do. And you know me, or perhaps you get the sense of me. Yeah. You would I would have that. done it. Yeah. 100%. All I needed was some bloke to fig- effectively hold my hand, help me out, put me in a motor vehicle, drive me down there, and I would have done the deed because that was the logical way out and that's what I was looking at. That's what I wanted. And if you like, quite cleverly, he gave me an ultimatum and he said to me, look, he said, um, you know, I'm willing to help you out, but I want you to do something for me. Okay, okay, what is that? You know, and um, he said, I want you to hold on for one calendar a month, you know, just hold on for me. And I was pretty mortified at the time. I was like, you know, horrified at that statement because I couldn't do it. Like another month just felt like an eternity to me, given the situ- given the condition that my body was in and the very, very lowest ebb state of mind that I described. I didn't want to hold on any longer. But he said, look, if you hold on for me, he said, I will help you. So what, what choice did I have? And that was the deal, take it or leave it. So as friends, if you like, almost as business associates, we shook hands and that was it. Anyway, life started to take, turn a bit of a corner, not overnight, might I add, but life started to turn a bit of a corner over the course of uh, the next month. And I, start, I, I, I remember going for a surgery during the course of the following week and my consultant, who was an Indian gentleman, came in one morning, he was sort of wagging his tail saying, look, guess what, we've got a new, um, we've got some, some skin that's, some fresh skin that's been harvested and basically I knew where that comes from. It comes from like cadaver or some sort of uh, um, the proceeds of some kind of uh, surgery where they harvest the skin um, and then basically I receive the skin as the burns victim and they can do that specialised grafting to put it onto my wounded areas to give me kind of cover to allow my own cellular structure underneath to try to knit together and heal. And that was the idea behind all these kind of skin grafts. And I had many such operations. And he said, he came in wagging his tail, the Indian um, Burns consultant. And he said, um, he said, you know, I'm really excited. He said, we've got, we've got the skin that we need. It's coming in like two days time. He said, I'll take you back to theatre and we'll do this big operation on you. Anyway, we did the op. I went down again, I did the op. And when I remember coming to in the um, recovery room in Stoke Mandeville, and you know what, for the first time in many, you know, all those months, my skin, my wounds didn't feel so painful. It wasn't so uncomfortable. And I wasn't sort of screaming blue murder like I normally was, you know, kind of like begging for more kind of painkillers or analgesia. And, um, and I and I felt somewhat better. I couldn't quite get my head around it, but I felt better. I felt stronger. So something was happening, right, in in the body, in the healing. And indeed, about four or five days later, a hundred or so hours until the nurses are kind of compelled to take the dressings down for the first time post these skin graft surgeries because they need to check on it, they need to clean the wounds, clean the like fresh dressings. They took all the dressings down and did the visual kind of observation of all my body and the wounds. And, and they were, all of a sudden they were like really animated and excited saying, wow, this is amazing. And your wounds are like starting to show real visible signs of healing here. That surgery that the uh, consultant did on you was, um, was had a, has had a tremendous result. He said, you, you, you know, you should, be, you should feel proud about this, you know. And indeed in my mind, there wasn't so much pain. There was something going on. So the healing was starting in body and mind. Within. And that was the start of me turning the corner. So with big trauma, they talk about the point at which you start to turn a corner for the better and you start to recover. It's not easy to put a handle on that and to put a finger on it exactly. But for me, that was the start of the turning point. But for the record, I want to make it clear that it wasn't like a right angle that I turned and then suddenly all was good. Yeah. It wasn't like I went around that street corner it, this was like it felt like the curvature of it's the earth process. remember that journey was a two year kind of turn for the trauma is that we all go through trauma in life everybody's traumas are different from everybody else's is it to accept the trauma first understanding okay it's happened do you think that's the moment that you need to accept to then heal I think there was a number of things going on so I think probably fundamentally 
the process of the physical healing because remember this was medically for the record i was 63 percent third and fourth degree burns massive open areas across the total body surface mm -hmm. area of jamie hull so the physical healing was crucially important for me if i could see progress or learn of progress through the doctors and through the nurses that were observing the body and the wounds etc and looking after me you know 24 7 in that in that burns unit then if i was receiving that kind of positive information then for me that was having a knock-on effect and i was the kind of guy remember logical thinking mindset mm. I needed to see results. I needed to see progress. I needed that development because that was kind of who I was, what I was all about. Remember, I was always about self-development, self-progress and trying to get on in the world. Mm -hmm. And even being a burns victim, I just needed to heal. I needed to progress in that department to enable me to take the next steps in, you know, tentatively in the new life. If you're, if, you, yeah. if you're with me. Looking for a bit of hope to then Absolutely. progress, to re-rise. Do you think because things weren't working for the first 18 months because you weren't believing in yourself and you weren't believing that there was any hope that you wanted to die, so it wasn't really yeah. affecting it. But then as soon as that man came into your life and then as soon as you got a glimmer of hope, then you start to believe and then you start getting fitter, then you start getting stronger, then the confidence starts to come. Like, it all comes down to the way we think, the way we see the world. Absolutely. Like, that's what I always try and promote is everything, you are what you see and you are what you think, you are what yeah. you speak. Like when you're down and out, man, it's easy yeah. to jump and go, fuck For it, sure. I don't want anything. But when you start getting glimmers of hope and then you start getting that self-belief, yeah. shit, man, that's the golden key. And that's where your inspiration comes in. That's where people will be watching going, fuck me, what have I actually got to complain about? Yeah. Because we all live in luxury. Majority is living luxury. We just love to complain and moan about well, the stupid shit. I mean, just for me to be sat here now all these years later, just thinking about it, you know, I've got my back to the, the high back of this, this chair. You know, it's a comfortable chair, granted. But given the condition of my body back then, I wouldn't have been able to sit against the back of this chair because yeah. I, the wounds were so painful. So just to be living life in kind of abject sort of comfort, shall we say, is an absolute luxury. It's a blessing. And I, I learned these things. When were you on fire? Was it when you... Inside the plane, or was it when a plane crashed? No, no, in in within the within the confines of the cockpit before I managed to exit. So you still managed to think of all that while on fire? Yeah. So for me, it was a case of uh, falling back on my training because it was a drill that I was taught, just an emergency drill, an emergency protocol for for that type of aircraft. And it sounds complex, but it was actually relatively simple. Basically, following the dashboard, I just was able to turn everything off in sequence. So it was. Um, key to the ignition, um, the magnetos, the red switches, so alpha and bravo, off, off, master switch, off, lights off, strobes off, uh, fuel pump off, fuel selector valve, rotate off, everything off, off, off in sequence. That was the emergency drill. So a shutdown procedure and then glide in to and scrub off the airspeed. As I said, uh, headset off, unbuckle harness, open door, and then e that enabled me to, to exit. Did you have any thoughts before you went on that plane was there anything to say that something's going to go wrong today did you have any gut feeling or was everything just no not necessarily nerve? so at the beginning of the flight you know i was pretty happy you know I, I, by that stage i'd sort of i was used to the routine you know i'd had a fair few hours under my belt solo you know I'd, yeah solo and um and i'd been solo for indeed for about eight days so um you know in my mind i was in good shape and the weather was good. It was a bluebird day by all accounts, a few puffy clouds in the sky. So I felt pretty good about, you know, what I was doing like any other day. But as fate would have it, it sort of uh, took a very different turn. And little did I realise that I'd end up um, facing what I faced. I mean, um, unfortunate. But then when I look back, frankly, you know, now, um, I've long since learned to accept it. So... You know, bottom line for me, it took about three years of healing, that what I was describing earlier on in the physical sense, until I was physically healed. It took about five years mentally healing and acceptance. And over the course of time, sort of with great will and determination, I was able to take those tentative steps into a new life and then challenge myself in all kinds of uh, 
um, new and perhaps unconventional ways that I hadn't kind of considered. So I did all sorts of things, lots of challenges, events. Um, um, I did a lot of expeditions. I worked in the expedition sort of field, in the expedition world, led a number of expeds around the world for different teams and groups. Did a lot of scuba diving again, sort of climbed the ladder in the scuba diving world and went on to qualify as a as a very senior instructor with the the the, the diving organisation Paddy that I do a bit with. And you uh, climbed Kil- Kilimanjaro as well. Yeah, I climbed Kilimanjaro. That's um, unbelievable, Jamie. Honestly, it's big fucking old mountain, unbelievable, man. Yeah, I mean it's not an easy mountain, and it's about nearly. So it's, I think. Um, from memory, it's just shy of 20,000 feet yeah. or about just shy of 6,000 mm-hmm. meters. Um, but That's yeah, it, these things inspired me. And of course, you know, I got to um, benefit, if you will, as a beneficiary for certain uh, charities that I was on the receiving end of Help for Heroes, Blesma, Pilgrim Bandits. And these charities were um, inspirational to me. I got to work alongside like-minded um, wounded servicemen and women and I got to go on various challenges and events in different locations around the world and having that kind of camaraderie and that banter you know as teams as groups we kind of in the in you know uh, you know together we learned to sort of believe in each other and what we were capable yeah. of what was it like Jamie from being the impulsive kid to then traveling the world and trying to make something happen with me for your life and then with all the buns what was it like the first time you'd, you'd looked at yourself after everything you'd been through in the hospital? Was it a week, six months when you looked and what were you thinking? <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was pretty awful, actually. I remember um, the nurse in Essex and uh, I'm not very good at the accent, but she was like, um, got to get you moving now, Jamie, got to get you moving, got to get you set up. And I'm like, what is going on? And this was like the beginning of the the real journey because remember before that I'd been six months sort of drug induced so I wasn't really that aware of what was going on in fact the only thing I remember from America frankly after the original airlift and being taken to the hospital and talking to doctors there uh, the only thing I then remember is like one female American accent and that was my nurse in America my sort of lead nurse but um, you know this Essex nurse so six months on she's talking to me and sort of bending my my ear I mean, perhaps I shouldn't say that because I lost most of the ear anyway but she's sort of chewing it off maybe she was responsible <laughs> <laughs> and um, she's basically yeah bending my ear and sort of saying got to get you moving now got to get you set up in bed and there's this real fog and I'm kind of like what the hell what's going on and you know it was really confusing for me anyway no sooner had um, I sort of realized where I was and suddenly it dawned on me, and I'm now back in the UK. This nurse is speaking to me. And uh, and I mean, I just thought, oh my God, this is just horrendous. And the next thing she said to me was, okay, we're gonna get you a mirror now, Jamie. You know, you're gonna get you, um, gonna get you, have to, you gotta have a look at yourself because there's been a bit of change, you know, because you've been burned. And she was quite matter of fact, you know, quite frank about it. So she brought me in this, uh, handheld mirror and I basically had to take hold of it and look at myself for the first time and I remember seeing myself and, and back then you know this is a uh, sort of uh, what 13 13 and a half years ago my face was really quite swollen and I remember being pretty horrified looking at myself in the mirror for the first time face the scars were really red and blotchy and swollen I mean they were still kind of like scabby bits on my face where I'd been recently kind of had a bit of surgery and whatnot because I'd had a lot of skin grafts and um, it was a tough that was a that was a tough thing to swallow yeah and because I wasn't a bad looking lad you know I mean much like yourself James you know I was a pretty smooth looking operator thank you for that you know back in the day still smooth um, brother you're still smooth (laughs) that's all real fucking skin grafts right enough (laughs) how many skin grafts have you had maybe it's the uh, Scottish genes (laughs) who knows but um you know that, uh, but yeah, I was so I wasn't a bad-looking lad, mm-hmm. you know, in in my younger years, and uh, you know the burns did do a bit of a number on me, and uh, a lot of skin graft it visibly changed my appearance, and of course in the early years, I had to get used to all of that, and that 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 real visible change of appearance, and um, yeah, that was tough for me, and like I said, it took about five years to properly accept 
everything so body the change of facial appearance and um not an easy thing you yeah know. because in the day's society absolutely we're all you know. um we're all judged by appearance we all judge but when you actually connect with somebody's soul when you actually understand that everything's within then it's just a mirror it is just yeah. it's, but it's so difficult especially for yourself because i know girls who are models who still struggle to walk around the streets they've still got to be getting botox and fake tits and fake lips to try and feel some sort of sort of to keep up with society's needs so sure. For yourself, who's, who's got buns and stuff like that, do you, do, how hard was it then to be walking in today's society with people looking all the time? Does, do you eventually get used to that or do you ever feel like, what the fuck are you looking at? Or do you just kind of, <laughs> yeah. okay, I understand I've got buns? Because we, do, we are nosy, yeah. we do want to second glance and go, you, you want to know what's happened or you want, people we are curious. They are. Is yeah. that difficult then to be walking well, at the start make, or do you get used to it now? Yeah, I cannot deny that in the, in the very early stages for me, it was, it was bloody hard. I mean, I felt very self-conscious. And for example, you know, it wasn't so bad in the hospital because in the hospital, kind of like you almost, you're kind of institutionalized in a way. And you almost feel that, you know, you, you're permitted to look the way that you do as a victim of trauma, of, of injury, because you're in the hospital, right? And that's where people are there for, for all manner of, wounds injuries and so it didn't really dawn on me so much in the hospital remember i lived in the hospital for the first two years you know it might as well have been my residential address stoke mandeville burns unit um but it wasn't until i got home um so back to um so back to my mother's in in leighton buzzard in bedfordshire initially and um and i ventured out into into the local cul-de-sac and sort of managed to start you know learning to walk a bit further and then suddenly I'm walking down the street and I'm suddenly feeling pretty self-conscious because people are looking at me and um and that was pretty tough and I'd sort of shy away you know I'd sort of be sort of head down just do my walking and I didn't really want to look at anyone I know I remember that and um I couldn't go down the high street you know where it was all going on with the markets and everyone coming and going from the banks the shops and supermarkets I, I didn't want to go there you know, it was a tough thing for me. And it, it took me probably a number of weeks of just slowly, you know, very tentatively getting out there back in society and walking a little bit further and a bit further again before I kind of felt comfortable with um, being out in society again. And it was all weird, you know. I mean, um, you do notice people looking at you and people staring. It's almost doing a double take when you walk down the street. I've, joke, I've joked about it over the years, but it's kind of like you feel like you're a B-list celebrity. <laughs> you know like uh, people look at you and look again in the street because like clearly they see something different and um but anyway i mean you know over the course of time i learned to accept it things happened a couple of examples you know th little things that i remember i remember going to a doctor's surgery and i'm in the waiting room you know with predominantly adults like men and women waiting to see the gp and all of a sudden there was this young girl and she's probably only three or four years of age and she's with her mum, you know, just sort of, st I think she was kind of stood in between her mum's legs as she sort of sat on a chair and she kind of bleats out in the public and you know how these doctors' waiting rooms are quite quiet and she sort of makes a remark and says, mummy, what happened to that man? And her mother was clearly sort of, oh my God, she was like mortified. You know, a daughter should say such a thing in front of me, in front of the whole doctor's waiting room. And I just thought, I just felt compelled to sort of break the ice a little bit. And I just sort of, uh, sort of leant forward on my chair and, and sort of looked at the girl and looked at the mum. And I just sort of said, look, I said, um, I said, it's okay. I said, uh, I said, I had an injury. I got a burns injury. Um, I was in a fire and I just kind of kept it brief. And I didn't give her the long-winded version. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> um, but I remember sort of just breaking the ice in that respect and, and telling the story very vaguely and briefly mm. to the little girl. And she was kind of like, ah, oh, like this. And kids are kind of quite interesting. They're great like that because, you know, they're kind of... Uh, Innocent. Yeah, they're listening. They're just taking it all mm -hmm. in. And they don't really understand that, did they overstep the line yeah. kind of thing by asking you? Whereas all the adults are like... Scared. They look at me, they yeah, look yeah. again, they double mm. take. But they're not necessarily going to ask me that question. You might get it in the pub or something. Some guy's had a couple of Dutch courage. And he leans across and says, Hey, mate, what happened to you, if you don't mind me asking? 
you know, he's feeling a bit confident. Mm -hmm. And I've had that before, you know, yeah. and depending on the mood that I'm in, sometimes I tell him for real what happened. Or sometimes I just shrug it off and I just say, yeah, whatever. I just had an accident. No big deal. Sort yeah. of move on. I think that shows your character, man. Like, there's not many people would come through what you've come through, brother. Like, it's fucking unbelievable, mate. I'm inspired. Yeah. Like, I like to moan and complain about certain things. I'm a workhorse. Like, we just don't know what's round the corner. We don't know what kind of circumstances. We don't know what anybody's going to throw in front of us to then learn from, to grow from, to become that individual. Just so happens you've been through what you've been through, but you've not let it fucking quit, man. You've not let me say, okay, I'm just going to forgive and then go to Switzerland. Like, how close that was. Do you question your whole journey from everything you went through till now to then think, why did the, why has this happened to me? What's the reason for it? Oh, mate, I mean, honest to God, literally when I said like three years of healing, five years mentally, so when I was on that journey, <clears throat> I questioned a lot. I mean, I was constantly grieving the old me, so call it Jamie Hull version 1.0, you know, that guy. I was constantly grieving that guy. But it took me years to properly understand that he was never coming back, that I had to learn to accept version 2.0, you know, the new me, and work with the new toolbox. Yeah, because you're still Jamie was. Hull. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And my new appearance mm -hmm. and, and whatever. The, yeah, there'd been changes, you know, I've got some physical disability, you know, with the, the walking, or I've got a bit of nerve damage or whatever. I've got some change of appearance, you know. And, but, you know, eventually I learned to properly accept it all. And, um, and I, I pinch myself now in a way that, um, you know, that thing happened to me and that I was able to survive that gravity of trauma and pull through. Like, I, I still don't really understand how on earth I was able to pull through that. And, and you know, because it was such a massive trauma. And, you know, but there was a massive grieving process that I went through, questioned it an awful lot. Took me a long, long time to accept. I mean, for years, literally, every time I looked in the mirror, I'd start virtually, if I looked in the mirror too long, I'd feel like I'd start welling up. You know, it was a terrible thing to kind of come to terms with. And, um, but you know, none of that really bothers me anymore. It took me, it took me a long time, but eventually, and it's a miraculous thing, but as the old saying, time is a great healer, and it really is. So with the passing of time, I truly learned to accept the new me and that new version. Yeah. And that was what enabled me to really get on in the world, you know? Yeah, it's unbelievable. Like I say, people were watching thinking, fuck me, man. Like, it's an unbelievable story from what you've been through to what you're achieving now, climbing mountains, not quitting, doing inspirational talks, writing, writing books. Like, I always say this shit, but as long as you've got air in your lungs, you've always got something to give, no matter your appearance, no matter how fucked up you are, no matter how, how old you are, or what you've done in the past, like, People can change, people can make changes, adapt to the situation, and then kick on and, and still create an amazing life. Like, life is just... It's, it's true, fucking... it's true, James. But what I will say on that is, um, no matter who the individual, no matter what the journey, no matter what the, um, the issues they face, if you want to get on in life, you've got to fundamentally want to help yourself. And you've got to be hungry for that kind of process to, to nurture your, your path. It doesn't just happen. You've got to want it. And that's the things that I learned in life. I think looking back at perhaps my military service, there was a reason that I was able to achieve and perhaps get to some of those parts or points in, in the service where yeah. I got to. Do you still get any pain or anything, medication, stuff like that? Um, I'm not so much pain, no. Um, fortunately, things are pretty good in that de department. But, um, you know, I... Um, you know, I'm still, believe it or not, under a consultant now. So even after all these years, I'm under um, a laser doctor. So they're still doing, doing a bit of work on the face and tweaking some of the scars. Are you excited, though, for the future, like the new technology that's coming out, things? I think somebody's just got a fucking head transplant there and brain <laughs> transplants and, like, the future. Like, There's hope for me yet, then, yeah, head transplant. <laughs> but to, like, I, like, new things are coming out, because I've seen people getting, yeah. like, with skin, the, it's, it's just attaching and everything's... Are you, planning for the future do you look into stuff like that to see what's well, there for yourself honest to god i mean it's quite interesting i mean even a few years ago now i was offered like full ear reconstruction but when i looked into it um i think it's a japanese technique called nagata named after the japanese surgeon that kind of uh, pioneered this but what they do is they actually cut into the rib cage and they do something because they scoop it out the cartilage from the rib 
It's called cookie cuttering mm. to scoop out that cartridge. They can then malleate it and, and sort of, because it, it's got a cartridge is quite sort of malleable, they can then form it into an ear and then basically in terms of the plastic surgery, they can reconnect and then you've got a more aesthetic ear. But when I ask the questions, okay, because my hearing's a bit dodgy from the, where the aircraft piled in in the distance and then exploded mm -hmm. and that blast um, damaged my ears somewhat and I've got this permanent tinnitus. I said to the surgeon, is it going to help the pickup you know, in the audio sense? Am I going to enhance my quality of hearing? And he said, no, not really. He said, it's only going to help like the aesthetics outwardly in terms of your appearance. And I'm like, I'm not that bothered then, honestly. What about stem cells? Um, yeah, there was a lot of talk about stem cells, but I think, believe it or not, things are happening in the world of stem cell surgery. But I think they're a long way off, um, you know, you know, making sort of uh, real practical gains with all of that at the moment. I think um, it's still very much in, in its infancy. But I do think that there's huge scope for that in the future, having looked at a few documentaries and even talked to a few surgeons over the, over the years. Um, and it's likely that, you know, they're going to be able to possibly, you know, grow uh, complete organs for potentially for, for complete sort of stem cell organ transplant. So there's going to be probably no end to what they can do in the future. Who knows? But, I mean, listen, they've come a very long way. I mean, the reality is... Um, my injury was 2007, so I was in hospital till 2009. And let's say that injury had happened even 10 years before. There's the likelihood w would have been that perhaps in the acute phase of the intensive care, they may not have necessarily had the expertise to, to kind of keep me going and, and bring me back from that. Yeah, it's unbelievable. So, That's why you've got to give a, like, a massive thanks and appreciation to the nurses, the doctors, what they do for individuals is unbelievable. Tremendous. Like, they don't get enough credit. They're the ones who should be getting footballers wages. They're the ones who <laughs> should be getting looked after the yeah. most. Like, my mum's a home help as well and the stuff that they need to do and cleaning up shit and piss every day and night and yeah. helping people and just trying to be there and comfort people. It's honestly unbelievable. That's why I always believe there's so much goodness in the world because there is so much goodness in, that people do and it's, it's a great thing to see that. The oh, there's a lot of great work that yeah, goes yeah. on. There really is. And you've got to see that and not necessarily look at like, look at, it's easy to look at the negatives in life and look at mm -hmm. perhaps the darker side of life yeah. that I mentioned and focus on that because we've got the media kind of propagating that kind of information regularly. But there is an, an awful lot of good that goes on in the world. And um, indeed, yeah, a lot of medical staff are doing tremendous work out there for so many people. Yeah. Where do you go from here now, brother? So from here... Um, you know, there's bits and pieces going on. I'm still doing a bit of speaking work and there's a bit of demand from that. And I'm still trying to gently sort of promote uh, the book as well. And, uh, you know, meeting people, good people like yourself doing Thank these big you, old brother. podcasts. So there's a bit more of that that will go on. Um, and then um, I'm kind of interested in possibly, you know, taking further steps, perhaps with the kind of corporate world and, and perhaps... Uh, you know, utilizing the story in the in the sort of corporate world a bit more, and perhaps, but maybe diversifying a little bit as well, and and perhaps sidestepping with it as well. So yeah. maybe if there's a role that I could perhaps tap into, um, where I could perhaps help to connect uh, the corporate world with the charity sectors a little bit more, um, and and help with that, then that might be something that um, I'll look into. If you get a lot of people who go through like, a lot of trauma, maybe it's been burned, it's reaching out to you for to speak and at, look for inspiration to then. There's bits and pieces, yeah. So there's all kinds of weird and wonderful things that I do. So I've spoken to, I mean, all sorts of different audiences from from younger students in schools and sort of youth groups, uh, like young farmers, like women's institute. Um, to you know through to small businesses right the way through to some of the bigger corporates you know for like their annual general meetings as sort of guest speaker and so on so it's quite bizarre um you know some of the stuff that i've been um, subject to you know doing some of the speaking work that i do to help others mm -hmm. i mean just this week i had the um the the privilege of being away and speaking to um a team of um serving police officers which was quite interesting because they've come from all different forces around the country and they were on like a, 
a sort of a, an interesting kind of adventurous kind of respite weekend for want of a better description and um, I was kindly invited along just to uh, come and share the story about you know because obviously I had some service back in the day and talk about the trauma that I'd been through and how I was able to kind of hold on and sort of nurture my own development and come through all of that and I think that perhaps helped some of those guys and girls that I was talking to so yeah lots of different audiences and um, and uh, it's an interesting journey I mean like if you'd have said to me you know 15 years ago oh, yeah one day you're going to be you know you're going to be kind of out there talking sharing your life experience and being a public speaker I probably would have never have believed you but um, it is uh it's interesting how perhaps where one door closes, <laughs> if you've got yeah. the uh, ability to embrace a new life, as it were, um, then other doors will potentially open up. Yeah, I think we've always got and, to... And also put your best yeah. foot forward. You I know? think we've always got to embrace new life, though. We've also got to embrace new circumstances. Like, doors always close, but you've got to be the person who fucking goes and opens other ones because they ain't going to open themselves. No. You've got to kick those fuckers down and say, look, I'm here, no matter what you've went through, no matter the circumstances for myself or anybody watching or listening, you've got to go and make it work. Do you know what I mean? There's yeah. plenty, there'll be plenty of people as well yeah. who's gone through the same shit as yourself, went through that sort of trauma, that's just quit, gave up. I thought I had it bad because I had a few addictions. I think people give up for far yeah. lesser reasons, yeah. perhaps. I mean, I don't want to yeah. com necessarily Mo compare no, that's a million and contrast. Percent, yeah, a million percent, no, yeah. You know, people may face, you know, lesser hardships and, and give mm -hmm. up you know and and that is quite a tragedy when you think about it because there's always a life to live and there's always um you know perhaps uh, blue skies around the corner when you've had like abject rainfall and sort of foul weather you know remember it, you know the heavens will open up and 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 you yeah. know and, and and the clouds will part and there'll be blue skies again life will get better mm -hmm. and you have to believe that and but I was going to say that it, it pays to sometimes have the courage of your convictions to, if you've got a little bit of ambition, even no matter how kind of small and how trivial that ambition might seem, if you've got the courage to perhaps put your best foot forward in life, you can surprise yourself and you can often pull things out of the bag and, and really get on in the world. I mean, I know people that have managed to pull themselves out of the gutter. You know, they've had perhaps a drink problems or, or drug problems for example they've acknowledged that they've got a bit of help and they've thought oh, perhaps there's no opportunities for me because I've got a bit of a criminal record or whatever but I've known such individuals that have then volunteered and they've got involved as a volunteer with various organizations and by volunteering sometimes they do a little bit of voluntary work even you know half a day a week or a couple of sessions per week and it's enough to meet people and connect and join the dots and then through meeting other people, as the old saying, sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. Other people can help you then open some doors and create opportunities. And so I've known people that have gone from being in a pretty dark place through kind of putting their best foot forward, perhaps doing a bit of voluntary work, and then that leads to whatever. And then the next mm -hmm. thing you know, they're in paid employment and they're really cracking on with life. Yeah. And there, you know, some, so I know of, of, of a few examples, mm -hmm. you know, very positive. Where can people get a hold of you, Jamie? So, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm contactable through um, social media. So I've got, um, you know, verified accounts and a page with uh, both Facebook and uh, Instagram. Facebook is uh, just Jamie Hull and in Instagram is I am Jamie Hull one. And then I've also got a website that I'm contactable through for mainly sort of the, uh, the, the element of speaking work that I do. Um, and that is uh, simply jamiehull.co.uk. For anybody watching that's maybe going through some trauma just now that f think that they can't get through it, what advice would you give for them? Simple advice. Um, you know, fundamentally, to not lose hope completely. Because remember, I was virtually there. I was right on the borderline of, of being that guy that was losing all hope. You know, and I mentioned that in the sort of the testimony of what I went through. But, you know... You know, from my own sort of humble experience, not to lose hope entirely, no matter how difficult or dark life can seemingly stoop, understand that, um, you know, there is um, light potentially around the corner. You've just got to kind of keep working and kind of 
keep kind of moving towards the you know those better days and hold on and if you work towards your objectives and hold on you can really surprise yourself and um, the biggest thing that I learned was um, to believe in yourself and to understand that, um, that ultimately through great will and determination all of us can overcome life's obstacles and that's what it's all about. Love it, Jamie. Listen, brother, for coming on today and telling your story. It's been unbelievable. Top, You're a true inspiration and so many people will get a lot from this. Can't wait to see what you do for the future, mate. I'm a massive fan, massive supporter and I can't, I'll be keeping a close eye to what you do. But honestly, brother, unbelievable and keep fighting a good fight. Cheers, James. God bless you, brother. Check out more of my podcasts on the right and be sure to like, share and comment your thoughts on this week's podcast. Thank you.